and I'm supposed to introduce uh, Dr. Van Sickle, but I'll be honest with you. Uh, it's hard to introduce a, a, a man with, the, with these kinds of, of uh, credentials uh, and having him put as much time and effort into what he's done for this, for this conference, for this uh, initial keynote. Um, I think you're going to be wowed on the information that he's put together and, and bringing forth uh, and bringing uh, his knowledge base, his wisdom to, to this whole thing. You've, you've seen his books, you know, and like Brent said, you've probably got them on your bookshelves. Um, he's spoken in so many places and has said so many, uh, set so many great precedents uh, in education, uh, not just uh, across the country, but worldwide. And so we really appreciate him kicking this thing off and uh, showing us, you know, really and justifying what, why this thing needs to be put together with surveying and GIS. So I guess, well, without further ado, if uh, Dr. Van Sickle, if you are ready to roll and share your screen and uh, we uh, uh, anxiously await uh, hearing your words of wisdom today. Well, <laughs> I don't know about the words of wisdom, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my very best uh, to, to get this right, first of all, to get the, share, to get the right shared screen. Uh, there we go. I think that's it. And I want to thank uh, Brent and Tim for the wonderful introduction to everything here. And I do agree this is so important. What a great idea. A new survey and GIS summit. What has it been? Has it been, what, 11 years, I think, uh, since this happened again? Uh, what wonderful, and I'm honored, I'm honored to be here. NSPS, National Society of Professional Surveyors, the Urban and Regional Information Systems Association team up, and here we are. And uh, uh, really, I for one, I'm, I'm thrilled. I think this is, I think this is great. Now, I read the announcement on the website, maybe you did, it says, leaders from the National Land Surveying and GIS Professional National societies, NSPS, URSA, explore the similarities and differences between two professions. Industry experts will share real world examples of new opportunities, hope to do some of that, and how the two professions often converge as a result. And, you know, I'd like to emphasize that particular part. The two professions often converge. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, whether we've recognized it or not, we've always been, we still are. We're in this together, just like it says there. We're in this together. Now to the GIS professionals among us, thank you for being here. We need your knowledge, we need your skills, we need your experience to the land surveyors among us. We need your knowledge, your skills your experience, because the mountain of change that's in front of us, as Brent has said, it's, it's bigger, it's more complex than it's ever been. As a matter of fact, on a recent NSPS podcast, the surveyors says, I heard Brent say, I've read estimates that the next 10 years are going to present more change to us than the previous 100. And if that's the case, we want to change and grow together. We don't want to grow onto different islands and isolate ourselves. Yes, yes, yes. So, so that's fine. I, I agree with all that. But how do we manage it? How do each of us take advantage of those new opportunities out there? And boy, there's a lot of them. May I make a modest suggestion? We can all make the most of them by continuous learning. I recommend it. You know what, I'll bet you're saying to yourself, I'm already doing this and I, and, and I believe you, I think you are. You've probably been learning new skills throughout your career. I can certainly say it served me well, but you and I both know it isn't easy. 
If you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to tell you about some of my uh, geospatial education. I won't go on and on, I'll be quick. Maybe some of it parallels yours. I started transit and tape surveying as a Rodman in 1963, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, I think. And I've been surveying ever since. Even so, in 1969, I was obliged to learn phase differencing because I wanted to understand and use the Vilt Distomat EDM, one of the one of the early ones. In the early 1980s, I enthusiastically learned the workings of GPS to be able to lead an early GPS micrometer crew. Uh, the micrometer was one of the first uh, uh, GPS uh, receivers. Next, I had to learn Unix and really brush up on my public land survey knowledge because I, I wanted to work uh, with the original notes in building the BLM's geographical coordinate database for all the PLSS corners. And that of course led to learning more and more about GIS. So I would be able to lead the group that built the GIS for 25,000 miles of fiber optic backbone around the world. Next, I had to gain some knowledge of the international GNSS resources that are available out there, like the uh, uh, network of control stations available to us all. To inform my team's collection and processing of ground control for, what was it, 100 and 125 cities around the world. In anticipation of a project in the District of Columbia, I had to quickly learn LIDAR, a terrestrial LIDAR, as you see, and, and building information modeling to help create the BIM of the White House and the Eisenhower office building. That's a, a Revit model right there of, of, of what we did. Now, I definitely <laughs> needed more geodesy and cartography education uh, to assist in the revision uh, of the geodetic network and the cartographic coverage of, of Nigeria. Next, it was gravity, magnetic, hyperspectral analysis uh, education to help with the evaluation of the Borzon 7 concession block for exploration in the South Gobi in, in Mongolia. Now, I admit to you that I really had to struggle uh, to learn uh, what's known as the Agile process. And, and of course, GIS uh, DevOps architecture. So I could serve as the uh, solutions architect at PG&E's GIS Center of Excellence. Well, today, now, I'm working as principal engineer on mapping for autonomous driving at HERE technologies. And it's right here in this context, right here, that I would like to bring up what I consider a real world opportunity that was mentioned in the, in the blurb at the beginning on the website for this conference. This is the kind of mapping uh, that we're doing it here. It's, it's pretty ambitious. And, and while working on this, it's occurred to me that there is a place for the very professionals attending this conference right now in this work. In fact, uh, my opinion is your skills are, are needed, desperately needed in this work. But let me hasten to add, it will very likely require some of that continuous learning I mentioned a moment ago. Let me explain. The mission statement here says, creating a digital representation of reality to radically improve the way everyone and everything, my emphasis there, everyone and everything lives, moves, and interacts. That is an enormous scope. It's comprehensive and it's global. Now they're by no means alone in this. There's an awful lot of quite large companies actively building the digital geospatial planet right now. Amazon, Facebook, Waymo, Alphabet, Google, Uber, Lyft, TomTom, et cetera, et cetera, Mapbox, 
mapillary, many, many, many more. And typically they aren't, they aren't working with Esri or Trimble tools. They're working with Flink and Argo and GitLab and Kafka and et cetera, et cetera. They're sharing work with Jupyter Notebooks, automating development with Kubernetes, using GeoPandas to allow spatial operations on geometric types and, and GitHub for source control and so on. So what's my point? My point is the engineering managers, the C, C++, Python coders, data scientists, the, the TPMs, the scrum masters, etc., work in the world of DevOps. Now DevOps is a word may be familiar to you. Uh, it combines development as in software development and operations. It was coined about a decade ago. It's a process, it's a culture uh, that seeks to optimize the productivity of developers and, and the reliability of operations too. Now I think Mr. Ron Vincent, he's a cloud architect over at Microsoft. I think he might agree with me that there is a need for your expertise in this work because he wrote, I'd like to encourage all GIS practitioners to look into these technologies. I believe, he said, that DevOps will become standard operating procedure for GIS, just like it's standard operating procedure for all app development. Well, what do you think of that? Do you think that points to an opportunity? It's worth a look. As you may well know, software development is now done in the Agile process and more and more are moving to DevOps too. And they typically work very closely uh, together. So more from, from, from Mr. Ron Vincent, he goes on to write, let's place the GIS analyst, GIS database administrator, GIS developer and surveyors. I added that part because I think that needs to be added here. He didn't write it, but I added it. Together on the same agile team so that they can add value to their organizations. It's been learned that placing these diverse team members on the same team together can deliver faster with greater quality. And I wholeheartedly agree because Without you guys on these teams, the folks developing mapping in these organizations at worldwide scale are very unlikely to, for example, look at survey data or, or features sourced from GIS to train deep learning networks. They are much more likely to look at collects from uh, simultaneous location and mapping, SLAM, or structure from motion mobile mapping data, probe data, well, and that can be anything from smartphone feeds to uh, rental scooter tracks. And speaking for myself, I constantly run into ideas like, come on, latitude, longitude, we're just a couple of cop columns in a database. And data is data. And it's content. What's the big deal? Oh boy. Surveyors, GIS professionals like, like you folks need to be on the team because your background, your work experience, your skills are precisely tuned to dispel these things like this. You can ask, you can answer two the critical questions that must be raised at moments like this because they're too often left behind. Questions like, what are the geospatial requirements here? Can, can these data provide them? And, and how do we know they can or can't? Within what limit? At what confidence level? Is there a more efficient process? What's the reference frame? What's the epic? Is there a better way to satisfy this use case? How accurate are these measurements anyway? And what is the reliability of these data? Are they fit for 
purpose. And you, you can probably add a whole lot more that I haven't had the wit to list here. So now, all right. Can I give you a not entirely fictional example of why these questions are critical? So critical that in some cases, they involve safety of life. I read an article in an industry journal recently uh, that mentioned in recent years, surveyors have been recovering the historical PLSS marker posts, interesting phrase, and assigning GPS coordinates, usually in state plane systems. And the state plane coordinates can be easily retrieved. And then it mentions this site where oh, you can download the Bureau of Land Management PLSS data uh, for a dozen states. It's very convenient. However, there's some really important information you need uh, to use it correctly. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to find. You have to go down to the uh, very bottom and uh, click on info and then another site opens up and then you uh, you click on metadata and then finally here's the, the uh, here's the fine print. These data may contain errors or omissions. The user assumes entire risk, bears all responsibility determining whether these data are fit for purpose for or for the user's intended use I should say. It may not have the accuracy, resolution, completeness, timeliness, or other characteristics appropriate for applications the potential users of the data may contemplate. Data are neither legal documents nor land surveyors should not be used as such, and the user should not represent the data. Okay, whew, okay, okay. May not be accurate, not a survey, do not misuse, not, got it, got it. As I mentioned earlier, <laughs> 30 years ago, I worked on this, the BLM's uh, GCDB, the Geographic Coordinate Database. We mapped the PLSS using original field notes constrained by, uh, well, somewhat questionable control stations, like section corners digitized from the OSGS quad sheets. Now at the time, I expressed my concern that the corners and the lines that we were producing were not actually the PLSS features, they, but they would likely be presumed to be those by some users. And at the time I was assured that there were caveats just like the ones I just quoted. And I was told that no, no, they, they ensure that no one could possibly mistake the GCDB corners and lines for the real thing in the real world and, and such misuse was not gonna happen. So fast forward to a decade later and I was working as a consultant to a major in the oil and gas sector. And there was this uh, surface well location. The well permit that would have been sent to the oil and gas commission includes a coordinate um, from which the surface well location was correctly shown in the company's operational mapping. The uh, section lines uh, in the same were from the BLM's geographical coordinate database, the GCDB. And then this is the uh, directional bore from the surface well to the bottom hole. It's a directional bore, it's um, uh, mostly horizontal from what you see here. And both the bore and the bottom hole were in section 30, along with the mineral lease. Uh, looks like everything's just like it should be. Uh, the owner of the property is all set to receive royalty payments uh, from the production of the well with its uh, well surface location at uh, 717 feet north of the section line, just like it said in the well location information and 763 feet from the west section line, according to the official record. And you could easily stop right there. And a lot of folks did. 
So they didn't know that there's a real problem here. This mapping actually shows the well surface location 851 feet from the north section line, 136 feet long, and 700 feet from the west section line, 63 feet short. All right, here's my question to you. What would you do now? Is the well location survey wrong? Is the mapping wrong? How do you proceed? What, what, what do you do next? Well, let's pause just for a moment on the, my little story here and consider what's at stake. First, will you please note that there are actually several more wellheads here and there are directional bores emanating from them too. For example, here's the bore we've been talking about and then here are the potential bores from the other wellheads. Uh, that's quite a spider's web. And this, uh, by the way, is in what's known as the DJ Basin in Weld County, Colorado, which is one of the most active oil and gas fields in the world. This is a map of the well density in this play. And we are right in that with this uh, example. And then there's lots of other wells too, and, and, and lots of bores in the neighborhood. Great care, I, I should emphasize, is taken to ensure that separation between these bores uh, is, is, is clear. So, because if there's a collision, the consequences of an unplanned intersection with an existing well can range from financial loss to catastrophic blowout and loss of life. Please note the uh, houses in the vicinity. Okay, so the questions are, is the well location survey wrong? Is the mapping wrong? And, and how would you proceed to answer that or those questions? Well, maybe in collaboration with colleagues, you decide to look at some other section line data in this area. So you bring in some section lines from other sources. Here's a first survey firm section lines. They don't alter things too much, really. The bottom hole is still in section 30, but the second survey firm's determination of the section lines, uh, well, it changes things and it, it, it raises a lot of questions. Is the lease here? Is it here? Or here? Is the bottom hole here or not? And maybe most importantly, is this bore in the right place? Well, the answers depend to a large extent on which of these section corner is right. So this is an excellent time to ask one of those questions I was mentioning earlier. What is the reliability of these data, are they fit for purpose? Well, for part of the answer, here are the uncertainties of this particular GCDB corner at the northwest corner of, uh, of section 30. It includes the error in X and the error in Y fields. And here's a, an ellipse that does the plus or minus uh, one sigma uh, reliability. In other words, the corner really could be anywhere within that ellipse at about a 68% reliability. And the GCDB section lines, you could actually draw that wide uh, according to that. So the section lines could be also within 68% anywhere uh, within uh, those polygons. After all, the metadata that we looked at did say these data may contain errors and may not have accuracy resolution, et cetera, for applications that potential users of the data may contemplate. Okay, so, all right. So the GCDB corner and lines really aren't fit for purpose here. So that's interesting. Uh, okay, good, good. We know something here. However, 
the first survey's uh, data fits in there, and so does the second survey's uh, corner and section lines. That's good, that's good. But given the stakes, we still need to get this right. So which one do we choose? Well, here are some of those questions again. What are the geospatial requirements here? Uh, I would suggest in this particular instance, it's find the most correct section corners and lines for this step. Next question, can these data provide them? Well, actually, we need more information. We don't know yet. So how do you get it? Again, going back to your colleagues, maybe one from experience comes in and says, let's take a look at the at monument records. These are the written and illustrated documents describing the physical appearance of a survey monument, like, like this one, a Colorado Land Survey Monument Record which purports to show the monument here at the northwest corner of the section of interest, section 30. Let's see if it fits. Well, that, that two track road across the area could be the same one in the record. It's possible. And that tree could be that tree there it is about five and a half feet within the tie distance. Um, this is not terribly strong evidence, but we'll hold on to it for just a moment. Let's see. You got a, a monument tie within about five and a half feet over here. Well, what about the monument record at the north quarter corner? Let's take a look at that. Here's the monument record. And it says that this is in a range box and there it is, maybe. Okay, if this is accepted, how would it work with those uh, from north line, from west line distances we were looking at in the well location information filed with the commission? Now remember that the distances on the permit didn't match those if we used the GCDB section lines, raising the questions about the location of the well and the bore and so on. But it turns out that if the second survey is accepted and mapped, here are the distance that do match and they match uh, uh, within about three feet. So this GCDB is not a good representation of the section corner, the second survey monument is. And this is probably not a good representation of the section line, whereas this is uh, the most correct section line. So the lease is here. Uh, the bottom hole is in actually section 19, not section 30. Uh, the legal department might be interested in that. And looking again at those questions, so we can answer now the second one, can these data provide them with yes. But here's another very important question that that should, that should follow. How do we know? Always important. How do we know? Well, we have corresponding survey data with the monument record, with the permit, well permit. So that's our evidence. And that's the way we think we know. So congratulations to the team that solved the problem. Now let me ask you, who do you think in this group of collaborators is a GIS professional and who is a surveyor? Does it really matter? In my opinion, no, not in the slightest, because as I said, we're in this together. So let's not waste any time debating who's who. Both surveyors, GIS professionals have plenty of problems to solve and we'll get a lot more done if we don't worry about who's in the lead. So let me, if I may, suggest another circumstance where your geospatial background knowledge and work experience can really help answer a sometimes critical question. How accurate are these measurements? The Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, have defined several levels of self-driving technology. And I think we can agree 
that level four and five definitely fall in the realm of safety of life. It is very, very clear, especially when things go wrong. Here are some of the systems widely used in an effort to achieve safe level four highly autonomous driving, which is abbreviated HAD. Not everyone, but many working in HAD think that this digital mapping is one of the keys to success. So what are the geospatial requirements of such mapping? Well, it would of course need to be constantly updated and it would need to be highly accurate. How accurate? Now there's a hard question. Well, here's one idea on that. It was published uh, last year by Drs. Niels Gilbert and Dr. Tyler Reed and Fergus Noble in their paper, Developments in Modern GNSS and its Impact on Autonomous Vehicle Architectures. It proposes a specification of map accuracy. It's an estimate of necessary quality of mapping to support highly autonomous driving. The latitudinal and longitudinal accuracies that they recommend here are at 95% uh, reliability or 1.96 sigma. From these, I calculated the allowable tolerances in radial distance. And it turns out they're calling for the lanes on a highway to be mapped within 1.11 meters and local road lanes at 83 centimeters. They list in-lane positioning, should be 37 centimeters on highways and 10 centimeters for local roads. Wow, they are proposing a very high bar. How can that be done? Well, some working on this think that part of the answer is data directly from the cars already driving on the roads and highways. It's true that their positions are from non-differentially corrected pseudo ranges, but they are a source of massive amounts of data. Their sensors can provide comprehensive detections on road furniture like uh, speed limit signs. Here's a, a very simplified illustration of such a car passing by a, a sign and each car measures the center of the face of the sign as it, as it passes. And each of the measurements produces a point and the points build up and they become a cloud like uh, this cluster of 41 points. Here they are in 3D with the average or the mean. Now a one sigma error ellipse centered, ellipsoid I should say, centered on the mean here ought to enclose 68% of these measurements, right? Well, here's the 2.26 semi-major axis and a 3.22 for the 1.96 or 95%. And here's the 4.52 for the three sigma or the 99%, okay, good. Now with this information, would you answer the question, can you answer the question, how accurate are these measurements? Is it 2.2? 0.26 meters plus or minus, that's the 68% reliability. Or is it perhaps you could say 3.22 meters plus and minus, maybe that's better at 95% reliability. Or 4.52 meters plus or minus. Let me, let me say it another way, perhaps another way. If I bet that the true position of the center of the, of the speed limit sign is within 2.26 meters, I have a 68 per chance of being right. Or do my chances improve to 95% if I bet it's within 3.22 meters of the point of this particular point? Or would I be almost certain to win my bet, 99% certain, if I increase that distance to 4.52 meters? What do you think? You know, there used to be a TV show called You Bet Your Life. You know, I'm just not willing to do that. 
for myself or anyone else for that matter, especially when it comes to mapping for autonomous driving. So even though some folks might feel able to answer this question at this point, if you said, I don't know, I don't have enough information, I'm with you. Because here's the speed limit sign with all the measurements. And here they are in 3D. Closer look. The average of all the measurements, and now here is a control point from differentially corrected static GNSS right in the middle of the sign. And it's 3.61 meters between the control point and the average of the point cloud measurements. This information adds an important piece because I'm sure that you all know that while the root mean square error, RMSC, and standard deviation are virtually the same in an unbiased data set, that doesn't apply here. This is a biased data set. Therefore, even though the standard deviation one sigma and the 1.9695% and the three sigma 3D error ellipsoids around the mean of the point showed us the precision of the measurements. They couldn't provide us with the information we needed to talk about accuracy. For that, we needed to compare with the control. So the accuracy of the measurement, is it 3.61 meters? Well, no, not exactly, right? Because you have to include the uncertainty of the control. It's not perfect, nothing is. It's got a 1.96 sigma value of about 20 centimeters at 95%. So if we accept the GNSS control as the correct position of the sign and include the uncertainty of the mean itself along with the uncertainty of the control point, we might end up saying that we have an accuracy of about 3.62 meters plus or minus with 95% reliability. And actually, such a result is not at all surprising. The GPS receivers on cars that collect this data are usually in what is known in the shark fin that's on the back of the car. And they are typically standard positioning service SPS single frequency CA code receivers. As these authors say, they're among the lowest cost. Recent results, 3.286 meters horizontal, 6.301 vertical were recorded first quarter 2014 by GPS SPS assessments undertaken by the US Federal Aviation Association across the United States. And uh, the observed 95% horizontal vertical positioning accuracies for 28 GPS SPS receivers throughout North America, April 1 to June 30, three to 4.3 meters. So having a, a result in those neighborhoods, three and four meters is not particularly surprising given the source of the data. My point is, that many of those working on this stuff, the managers, the coders, the data scientists, the TPMs, the scrum masters, could really use the information that we just went over. And this is exactly where you can contribute. Now look, I know my presentation is brief and it's just really a smattering of the info about the volumes of data and all the processes involved here. There's of course a lot more to it, a whole lot more which means there's a whole lot more to know. Speaking of that, immediately following this, my esteemed colleagues, Brian Shaw and Michael Dennis, will present National Spatial Reference System Modernization, <laughs> that they will do an excellent job of describing the four National Terrestrial Reference Frames is absolutely certain. And, and, and I take it as a, if you'd please play close attention. Their topic will certainly affect all of us with the NSPS in North America and Caribbean and the Pacific. 
But among other things, I think they will likely mention that we are moving, as you undoubtedly know, to a dynamic system. Now, I have a worry on this subject that I would like to share with you. It's a concern. I see our mapping, including ever larger swaths of the planet, becoming truly global. And at the same time, as I'm trying to describe, we need higher and higher accuracies in our mapping. So the question occurs to me, how will we maintain high accuracy, safety of life mapping at a global scale? Now, please may I point out that I am not asking how we're going to build the mapping. That's yes, an important and difficult question too. But I am asking, even if we do, and I think we will build such mapping, how do we maintain it? May I explain? In the National Geographic Sur Geodetic Survey's current strategic plan, they write, the earth is dynamic and NGS must track temporal changes to de defining points of the NSRS to continually maintain the accuracy of the NSRS, the National Spatial Reference System. That's certainly correct. The earth is dynamic and temporal changes must be tracked to continually maintain the accuracy. Yes, but why is that true? Well, as you certainly know, the plates on which we measure have always and are now moving. Aren't we fortunate though, that today we know exactly how much and how fast, because there are thousands of stations on those plates constantly recording their positions and their velocities. There are four types of space-based geodetic systems at work on these stations. There's GPS, GNSS. And at these, there are Doris stations, Doppler uh, stations that look like this. And here are the very long baseline interferometry, the VLBI stations. VLBI is very widely spaced earth-based radio antennas that measure the time difference between the moment a wave front from a quasar reaches each of them. And from this information, they calculate the distance between them very, very accurately. And at these stations, there is laser ranging to satellites and lunar laser ranging, my goodness, to reflectors on the moon. Now such data does tell us how much, how fast things are moving as indicated here. So let's, just as an illustration, here is a primary control point in Paris. The station is called OPMT. It is moving at uh, 49 degrees east of north at these rates in Earth-centered, Earth-fixed X, Y, and Z. Okay, that means that if you want to know where OPMT is, you have to stipulate when. To know a coordinate, you must define a moment of time, an epoch. Here is a more concrete example of the concept, a road junction. The coordinates of that lamppost that you see up there on top that says positioned in 1994 is over here on the left. Those in the black are the WGS84, which as you know, is used in the uh, GPS ephemeris. It's a reference system. It's fixed to the earth as a whole rather than to any point on the surface. And it's also aligned to ITRF, the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, to within a few centimeters. The coordinates in blue are in the Australian coordinate reference system called GDA-94. Now it's fixed to and moves with the Australian plate. GDA-94 was also coincident with ITRF in 1994. So both of these, GDA-94 and WGS-84, were coincident, the same, 
on January 1st, 1994, just like you see in the, in the picture. But over time, the Australian plate moves north to northeast about seven and a half centimeters per year. And it makes sense that the blue GDA 94 coordinates don't change because it's moving with the plate. However, the WGS 84 coordinates in red are changing. We don't feel the motion because we're moving on the tectonic plate along with the street and the lamppost and everything. But because they're all moving with us, we see no change in the GDA 94 coordinates. That's why that's called a static coordinate reference system. But in fact, the tectonic plates and everything on it move slowly with the Earth. And therefore, the WGS 84 coordinate space and those coordinates change. And there's quite a bit of difference between the two uh, by 2020. But Australia fixed this by introducing GDA 2020, which will once again be virtually coincident with ITRF and WGS 84. Here's an illustration. Now assume that the two cars are using satellite positioning and they approach one another. The red car uses standalone GPS positioning with the WGS84 dynamic coordinate reference system. And the green car is also using GPS positioning with differential correction in the new uh, GDA 2020. And today there's no problem at all. However, Tectonic plate motion continues. Therefore, in another 20 years, GDA 2020 will itself be offset by the satellite systems one and a half meters. So if you want to avoid a car crash, use dynamic coordinate reference systems with care to combine the dramatic improvement in our ability to measure the storage of geospatial information in larger and larger data stores and the increases in accuracy of reference frame definitions. It made this issue of tectonic movement unavoidable. In more and more areas of practice, it is no longer adequate to know only where, it's vital to know when. In modern practice, the constant motion of the surface of the earth can't be ignored in light of stringent absolute accuracy specifications, the epoch, that is the moment of time and the reference frame, for example, ITRF 2014, must be considered. So, given that reality, the fact that the surface of the Earth is moving in many different directions at many different rates, I will repeat my question. How will we maintain high accuracy safety of life mapping at a global scale? I have ideas on the subject, but, but I would just like to leave this question with you as is for your consideration. If you'll do that, I have every confidence that you will arrive at a sound and a practical answer. We all need one. So I'd like to end where I began. We're in this together. Let's not waste any time debating who's in the catbird seat. Both surveyors and GIS professionals have plenty of mountains to climb. We'll get to the top a hell of a lot faster if we stop arguing about who's leading. Our software, our tools, even the scope of our work is expanding so fast that we all need, all of us need, to focus on continuous learning as much as possible, as quickly as possible. The sophistication of this stuff is mind boggling. Dynamic reference frames, epics, DevOps, SLAM, UAS data, mobile mapping, the NATRF, just, just, just to mention a few. We can contribute to all of them, but we first need to know more, a lot more about them than we do. As the Red Queen said to Alice in Alice in Wonderland, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. So let's help each other do exactly that because we're in this together. Thanks a lot.